our webinar with the general title, Do It Like the Minoans, When Sustainability Meets Cultural Heritage at Educational Crossroads. Uh, we are gonna have you all on mute, so please disable any audio and video if you haven't done so already. Uh, we will keep the questions to the end, so please take notes and remember to address questions either to either speaker or to the general idea of the panel at the end of the webinar. Uh, after the introductions, each one of us, myself, Katerina, and Geraldine, are going to have 10 minutes each for a presentation with uh, the support of visual materials, which uh, will bring us to approximately 8.40 p.m. Greek time. And this is going to give us another 20 minutes or so for a general discussion. But even if you have a question, uh, don't worry, it's not going to get unanswered. We can provide you with our email addresses. You can type the question if you want in the Q&A or in the chat. And we will make sure to download all questions. And if there is any question uh, left unanswered, we will get back to you, reach out to you and provide you with that uh, response. So uh, to give you the content and the context of the current presentation, this is done, this is part of the island innovation um, group. The island uh, innovation is um, a, a, an innovative way of connecting islands for positive uh, change. So we are doing events uh, that um, have mostly to do with island, but also rural communities to share innovative projects and best practices. Uh, uh, island Innovation is a social enterprise that works with private sector companies, governments, universities, NGOs, and utilities to connect them with the island stakeholders vital to the success of their sustainability projects. So the nice thing about Island Innovation is that it also has what it calls island ambassadors, so from any islands you might think of from all over the world, there are people representing those communities. And the goal is to reach out to the rest of the world by using technology. Obviously, um, these days uh, uh, is a very common tool for reaching out to other people to spread out the ideas of what they do in terms of positive change, sustainability, island communities, innovation. In our case, this is going to be done through the view of education. So both myself and Gener Geraldine are the so-called academics. We work in the academia, but Katerina also holds a PhD and she's a researcher. And you will learn many interesting things about how to go about uh, teaching others about the culture that you either come from, you either support or love or you work uh, you know, with. So now I would like to also welcome uh, Isabel Godoy, who is um, going to talk to us a little bit about Island Innovation. Uh, Island Innovation was founded by James Elsmore, who is also uh, the managing director of this initiative. But um, Isabel is with us today because she's also working with all the events and the ambassador initiative. So please, Isabel, go ahead and tell us um, some things about, uh, you know, Island Innovation, most likely the Virtual Island Summit, which is going to be a free event for everyone to attend in September 2021. Hello everyone, my name is Isabel Goy. Thank you so much, Maria, for this presentation. So uh, Island Innovation is a social enterprise focused on islands around the world. So I'm the coordinator of the ambassador program. We have an ambassadors from uh, islands worldwide and they represent their islands in order to um, uh, tell us about the, um, the information, the issues, the problems, challenge that the islands face in these times. So it's uh, really important for us to listen to these uh, webinars in order to learn, uh, to, to learn about the, the islands. Uh, it's not only Greece, uh, we have uh, many islands, but uh, this time we are glad to, to learn more about uh, Greece. So uh, uh, we will have a virtual island summit on September, from uh, September 6th to 12th. And uh, in this uh, virtual island summit, 
we cover the topics of uh, uh, sustainable development goals, talent uh, in islands, problem solutions, so everything around islands, and uh, and also our focus is sustainability, environmental issues, uh, water, oceans. So uh, if you want to attend, I will write the the, um, the link on the chat, and you can check the the information there. So enjoy this session and uh, this uh, webinar is part of the uh, island uh, innovation hubs uh, one of the our initiatives that we have for the ambassadors so the idea is to create this webinar in order to to uh, receive more information about the the islands around the world so thank you maria Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, we are not talking, we are not going to talk about the whole of Greece today. Greece includes both mainland and island, you know, communities, and there are far too many islands in Greece, so it would be impossible to cover all of them today. We are focusing on the island, I would say, and sorry to be like that, but I was uh, raised on the island of Crete, and I'm very passionate about the place of the world I come from, and I will talk a little bit about it in the beginning of my presentation. So we are all focusing today on the Greek island of Crete, which is the southest part of Greece, an island which is in the so-called Mediterranean. So as uh, it's the case with other islands in the Mediterranean, Crete shares uh, lots of common things um, with them as well because of this geographical and uh, historical Crete, sorry, about uh, because of its geographical and historical position. So let me introduce the speakers to you. And uh, I usually don't like doing that, but I will tell you a couple of things for myself. I have founded a program in Greek studies at Drexel University, which is in Philadelphia, United States. And I also work with uh, the World Council of Cretans, which is the people of Crete who live all over the world. And I also serve as an educational consultant for Kids Love Greece. And Katerina is gonna talk to us more about what Kids Love Greece is. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the Island Innovation Ambassador Program. I work uh, with uh, Greek studies pedagogy, cultural identity expressions, traditions and customs. And I'm also interested in misology, namely island studies, experiential learning and hybrid educational environment. My BSMA is in music studies and my MA and PhD in folklore and ethnomusicology. So I'm working with culture and tradition uh, mostly, and my main idea is that the same things happen all over the world, but just in different ways. So I will be the first one to talk to you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Katerina Makatuni, who is the co-founder of Kids Love Greece. Katerina studied political science and European studies in Athens, and then went to the UK for her master's and doctorate degrees. She stayed in England for 13 years, where she worked for market research and consulting companies. During the last 11 years, she has been living on the other side of the pond, Chicago at first, and now Boston in the United States. She is also the co-founder of Keros Consumers, a consumer research agency. She has two girls, 11 and 13 years old, who proudly say that they are Greeks and spend their summer holidays always in Crete. And our next speaker will be Dr. Geraldine Morrison. Geraldine is a fine art potter and a Fulbright scholar that explores the topic of what is Minoan cooking, with a PhD in archaeology specializing in the cooking vessels of ancient Crete. Geraldine received a BFA in ceramics and a B BA in anthropology and art history from Baylor University. In 2006, she received her master's from the University of Houston in archaeology and geology. She completed her PhD at the University of Leicester in the, United in, uh, the UK. She trained and then taught at Penland School of Crafts and she conducted archaeology fieldwork in Crete throughout all her studies starting in 1997. Since 1997, she has made Iera Petra Crete, her home base for research across the island, focusing on the everyday activities of the Minoan peoples. Geraldine currently serves as a senior ceramic specialist for the excavation projects of Moklos and Papadiokabos in East Crete. She also serves as consulting scholar at Penn Museum for the Mediterranean and also co-chairs the New York Aegean Bronze Colloquium a lecture series out of New York City focused on Bronze Age scholarship. So I hope uh, you will find our presentations interesting and mostly fertile ground for further discussion uh, upon 
uh, their conclusion. So I'm about to start with my presentation. Uh, can you all see my slide? Yeah. So first I wanna give you an idea of where in the world the island of Crete is. This is not a map of the world, but it's a map mostly of the Mediterranean. And it's important to know where Crete is because geographically speaking is uh, at the crossroads of three continents. And I don't know if there is any other part of the world where this happens. So you have Europe on the one side, Asia on the other and Africa on the South. So it's important because this crossroads of different civilizations and cultures has influenced and is still influencing today what Crete is. So it's a very fluid and dynamic tradition that was shaped many, many years ago when the Minoan civilization was coined right after the Egyptian one and long before the Greek one, which most of you most likely are familiar with. But it's important geographically speaking to know where in the world the island of Crete is. Recall the times when people to communicate with each other could only travel by boat. So if you wanted to go from west to east or east to west, you would necessarily have to pass through Crete. So it's a critical uh, you know, point still. These days, lots of geopolitical discussions are going on there. So this um, uh, you know, uh, has played an important role to the way that the people of Crete have been and still are. Historically speaking, uh, I spoke to you about the Egyptian civilization, then the Minoan civilization, the Greek civilization, the Romans, uh, the Arabs, uh, the Venetians, the Ottomans, you name them, all passed through the island through different periods of time. They coexisted with the people of Crete. And uh, this is, uh, you know, profoundly seen on architecture, uh, visualizing the island. This is a church and you can see the Ottoman style minaret on the one side and the Greek Orthodox uh, bell tower on the other side. So this is, um, I'm sorry, I think I stopped sharing. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, you are sharing, but uh, not in full screen. So you okay. have to go sorry. to, oh, okay. So this is another visual just to give you the different uh, architectural styles that exist on the island. So you can see the Arabic fountain, the Roman one, uh, the Islamic, the Venetian, the Byzantine, whatever you call it. But I just want to give you an idea of what we call amalgam when we talk about stones. It's what we see on the civilization of Crete today. And also uh, the idea of syncretism, which means bringing many cultures, living, coexisting together peacefully, of course, ideally. So this has been something that the Minoans the, in the ancient times had been struggling for. Um, and they were known as a peaceful um, you know, community of people that relied very much on sustainable ways on nature, on sports, athletics, performance, and many other things. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about the university that I'm associated with, which is Drexel University in Philadelphia, USA. And uh, since 2003, I've been uh, working with two major programs, the so-called study abroad, where students come to the island of Crete with me and they take courses that provide them with university credits and they study all aspects of uh, the culture, depending on what major each one student studies and comes from. And the other program is the so-called cooperative education, where we have every six months, fall, winter or spring, summer, students working, doing research, or uh, supporting uh, businesses under scholarship that a person from Crete, his name is uh, Vidalakis, Dr. Vidalakis, uh, has donated the money for. So since 2003, more than 700,000 euros has been allocated for research in Crete and another 300,000 euros for family visits and accommodation. Uh, 120 research students have come to the island and they were selected over a pool of 600 applications. So when they work with uh, us, the students choose their projects with Crete, the island of Crete always as the inspiration and the contemporary world with its future challenges for realization. The Minoan civilization inspires us them to establish an understanding of the importance of national and self-identity and further depict how such Minoan concepts have been expressed over time. 
what makes those programs unique to my way is uh, this is a poster by the university and this is the motto of the university and you can see a picture of the students in front of the Minon Palace of Knossos. Everybody studies Greece, but Drexel students leave it. So the program very much relies on experiential and empirical learning where the teacher facilitates education, thoughtfully assessing where the students at and probably the students own discovery. If we were to talk about a method, that would be the so-called Socratic method. Now, Greeks associated school with leisure uh, Plato's Academy being an example. Learning can and should always be enjoyable. Aristotle also identifies two significant spheres within experience which foster growth in general, the shared life and practice. And this very much connects to the contemporary Howard Gardner's theory at Harvard University, the so-called for multiple intelligences and the synthetic mind. And um, I will talk about it further down as well. Uh, the actual, um, you know, work is done through the so-called participation observation. So students participate, observe, and do things with their own hands. It's very important to do so nowadays when technology is uh, something that has dominated our lives. And um, in a few years, no one is going to know where the vegetable we use for cooking is coming from, believe me or not. So it's actually very important to take the student to the field, to have them do what we call field work. And part of field work is also the so-called participant observation. So everything is learned by participating through a community. The community can be a family. In Greek, we say ekogenia, which hides in the word ekos, which is our world, our planet, the system. Education, which has to do with pedagogy and friendship, which the English equivalent relies etymologically on the word philia. Now, when the students come here, we try to establish what we call them in non curriculum. So we take them to the archeological sites to where the civilization on the island of Crete started from. Here you can see a picture of students at the Dicteon cave, which is a mountain on the La City prefecture, it's the eastern part of Crete, where according to mythology, Zeus grew up. So we teach them the mythology we know, not because everything is accurate through mythology, but because people on Crete today believe they are the descendants of Zeus. So it's very important for the students to understand the general mentality of the contemporary world uh, by viewing it through um, the past as well. Uh, and I'm going to give you, because I'm not going to have lots of time to go over all of the projects, the 120 and on that students have done throughout all those years. One of, the, uh, of my students has worked, for example, uh, with the story of Theseus and the labyrinth and uh, has uh, created a Minecraft game. I'm assuming most of you know what Minecraft is. Uh, is a game lots of uh, children uh, between uh, 6 and 12 or even 6 and 15 years old are using today. I call it the, uh, the Legos on uh, the computer because it's like building with Legos but uh, through uh, a software. So one of my students has actually created a labyrinth uh, and these are some screenshots you can see from the game. But it's not, not only encountering the enemy, the Minotaur, when entering the labyrinth, but also unraveling the thread by learning the story about the labyrinth. So the important thing about this is the educational component to the game. And nowadays education relies very much on gamification. So it's very important, as we said, to make it joyful and playable for the students as well. Another student worked on sports, Minoan sports, and uh, the so-called bull leaping over the bull and tried to see what are the modern applications of this and found traces in France, uh, in Spain, uh, even in contemporary gymnastics. So she did a whole poster which uh, she presented at Drexel University. She was an honors student, so that went over the honors college. But just to give you another example of how we use the past, but also applying it on the contemporary world as well. And uh, my last example will be for um, the fashion world. And you can see in the middle a statue, a Minoan statue. And a student did uh, a research on how contemporary designers are using Minoan fashion. And here she is presenting uh, two costumes by Vivienne uh, Westwood. 
that they are, uh, you know, imaginative designs with an emphasis on the waste uh, based on the fall 2020 ready to wear collection. Of course, um, you know, there is lots to be said about those projects, but I'm just giving you a general uh, visual idea as well. So um, the way we work with the students very much aligns with the contemporary educational theory of social and emotional learning, the so-called SEL, from a vision of the whole child to a vision of a whole society, which is learning for an interconnected world. The role of social and emotional skills, the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And this is not new for us Greeks, because Plato, way back in the Republic, proposed a holistic curriculum that requires a balance of training in physical education, the arts, math, science, character, and moral judgment, which is exactly what the multiple intelligence and the synthetic mind project of Harvard University and Howard Garden is also doing as well, and SEL follows up with that too, uh, as well. Now, the values we uh, try to convey to the students are two unique Greek ones, philotimo and philoxenia. Both of them hide in the word etymologically philia, which I mentioned earlier on in my presentation, and stands for friendship, and also translates to the pride people take in their lives and their homeland a uniquely Greek ideal, which is called Philotimo. And if you Google President Obama and Philotimo, you'll see uh, he was using it in his speeches. Just Google, uh, you know, the word and you will find many, um, you know, people are using this ideal in the way they go uh, about talking about universal values and connecting people with each other. And um, Lots of students are, uh, you know, excited to be working with us. Here you can see a note that is handwritten in Greek by a student. Uh, the Greek part says, thanks for the chance that you offered to me. I had a very good time. I still can't find the words in Greek nor English to thank you for what you've done for me this summer. Um, I can't wait to see you again soon, whether in Crete or in Philly. And um, then I will end up my presentation with a quote from a student that was here back in 2019. There is something so soul nourishing about this island that the people that I have met, I'm over 5,000 miles away from home, but I feel like I was meant to be here all along. In just few days, I have gotten used to the kindness and simplicity of life and how the complex past of the island remains embedded into the culture today. I'm looking forward to continuing to expand my knowledge and love of this island. Day by day, I'm finding the Cretan that already exists inside my soul. So. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and I will ask uh, Katerina Makatuni to proceed with her presentation. Please, if you have questions, either type them in the chat or keep them for uh, the end of all three presentations. Thanks again. Katerina. Yeah. Give me a second. Can you all see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. Uh, Maria, I love the last quote. It's very powerful. <laughs> I loved it. Okay, so um, hi. Um, I'm Katerina. Wait, give me a second. I cannot. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so I'm Katerina Makatuni. Um, I'm uh, in Boston at the moment, although I was born and raised in, uh, in Crete, in Heraklion, um, and I'm the, one of the co-founders of Kids Love Greece. Uh, so what is Kids Love Greece? Uh, Kids Love Greece was created in 20, um, in how many years ago it was created? More than uh, eight, eight, almost eight years ago. Uh, uh, seven, eight years ago by th three Greek parents, myself and two more. And we are uh, a US-based travel agency that focuses exclusively on, on family vacation to Greece. Um, who is our target audience? We target families who wish to visit Greece with their families, with their kids. We help them to stay away from any tourist traps and we help them 
to make amazing family memories while they're staying in Greece. Um, as I said, we are three co-founders. It's Maria Yanuli, Maria Tsigoni, and myself, and Maria Hnaraiki is one of our educational consultants. Um, we, um, let me show you here our website. Um, we cover, as you can see here, many different parts of, of Greece, uh, but Crete, I should say, is one of our favorite destinations, um, not only because we were born and raised there, all, all four of us, but because we feel that is, is a great place for uh, a family to go visit and have create and have amazing family memories. Um, one second, let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so we, uh, we feel that Crete is a destination for all seasons. However, sadly, uh, we feel that the pot its potential has not fully fulfilled, especially among the non-European target audience. I should say at this point that most of our uh, clients are US-based and we've got also people from Australia, New Zealand, a few from India. Um, and we have seen that these people do not know much about Crete compared to the European um, families. Um, most of them, uh, if you ask them what do they know about Greece, they will mention Mykonos, Santorini, and Athens, and hardly they will mention Crete. Crete, for those that have heard of Crete, is mainly because of the uh, Greek myth of the Theseus and uh, Minotaur. Also, some of them are aware of some five-star hotels in Elunda, which is a high-end part of, of Crete. And um, I would say that uh, in the past few years, more and more know Crete because of uh, those beaches that um, dominate uh, Instagram, such as Balos and Lafonisi. So what we're trying to, to do with Crete, we are trying to uh, establish Crete in the mind of our uh, clients as the ideal family destination by capitalizing on its strength, the natural beauty, the culture and the tradition, uh, the cuisine, the hospitality, the weather, the monu new monuments and the museums, and of course capitalize on children's passion for Greek uh, mythology. Okay, so I showed you how the website uh, sorry, uh, here, uh, here. So um, in this presentation, um, I've decided to focus on um, explaining to you how at Kids Global of Greece, we use technology to promote Crete. And um, there are four different areas, starting with the first one, which is number one, we are a travel agency that and we are exclusively online. That means we don't have any physical offices, uh, uh, neither in the US or in, in Greece. We work, um, we have the website um, and all our consultants are in Crete. I'm the only one that is uh, in, in the US. Um, how do people you know, come to us and how do we organize uh, their vacation? Everything is being done online. Of course, if they wanted to talk to us, we are available for them, but we have seen that out of the, let's say 100 people that come to us, 95 are more than happy to do everything online. We hardly talk to them um, offline. Um, so how do they do it? They go online. Let me show you how it works. I cannot go on this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't think I can do it now. Anyway, so they go online, they pick up one of our tours, uh, and then they complete a form. Can you see here the check availability on the right side? And we receive um, the completed form. Or they send us an email, or um, they go to our live chat, and they chat with us, or they contact us through social media. 
go to the next one. Second uh, way that we use technology. Um, we have developed a, an app called Kislov Knossos. Uh, that was developed uh, in 2015. Um, and it's basically an audio guide for the Palace of Knossos, which is designed exclusively for kids. At this point, I would like to show you. I cannot. I'm trying to, to leave this. One second. Okay, so great. So I'm going to share with you a, a promotional uh, video that we have. Um, we have a uh, second. I want to make sure that it's here. So we have developed. And then I can tell you a little bit more about the, the app. Uh, Katerina, you can show us in a full screen. Yeah. Uh, no. Perfect. Εδώ λοιπόν κάπου κοντά μας, σε μια περιοχή που λέγεται Τεκνουσός, ε, υπάρχει ένα παλά, υπήρχε ένα παλά. Βασικά περίμενε. Welcome to Knossos. I'm Glaucus, a Minon boy, together with my little sister, Fedra. We will take a walk through Knossos. You will hear about Minos, Pasiphae, Androgeos, Ariadne, Theseus, and more. This. We go back to the presentation. So, what this uh, app is about um, you take your iPhone or iPad. We have not um, developed that yet for the Android systems, and you purchase the app, um, you open it, and then you've got um, a map uh, or that has 16 points. Each point corresponds to 16 chapter and each chapter uh, corresponds to a specific place within the Palace of Knossos. You click there and then you can listen to an audio story which is um, tailor-made to, you know, to the kids' language. So it's very simple um, narrative uh, and uh, includes a myth from the Palace of Knossos. Um, it, we have developed this app in Greek and in English. It's around 60 minutes long, and um, you can purchase it at home. You don't need to be and listen, listen to the stories while you're at your house. You don't need to be in the Palace of Knossos to use the app. Um, and basically, we have seen that parents and their kids uh, they download and they purchase the app from any location in the world. They just want to, to, to learn more about all the myths associated with the Palace of Knossos. We have also developed some coloring pages. So people that buy the app, we can send them uh, the coloring pages and that's an extra activity for the kids to do at their own time. Um, so that was the second one. The third, um, way that we're using technology to promote Crete and its monuments. In that case, the archaeological site of uh, the Palace of Knossos is uh, the usage of some tablets. So what are those tablets? Um, we have teamed up with a Greek startup called Moptil, and we use the Knossos 3D tablets during our guided tours in Knossos. What are those tablets? Uh, those tablets are they look like their iPads that are preloaded with the software, which offers a real-time 3D reconstruction of the Palace of Knossos. And it's a combination of virtual and augmented reality. I will show you in a minute um, a clip so that you can um, better understand 
what uh, this app is all about. Basically, you, ha you have the app and then you go in front of the different sites uh, and buildings in the Palace of Knossos. You point the app towards that particular uh, building and then you can visualize the exterior, but also the interior of this particular building, reconstructing with colors. And um, basically you can think of how the palace or the, that site within the Palace of Knossos used to look like many, many years ago. There's real time scenes of people and animals from the Minoan times. So it's a kind of, you know, interaction, the sound, video and graphics, and also GPS data. Um, one second, to, I would like to show you again another clip of uh, how uh, that tablet look like, looks like. These are parts. Katerina, can you go to full screen? Ah, uh, yes, I forgot. Okay. So I have to move all these windows. Um, so here are some uh, photos uh, before and uh, during some guided tours in the Palace of Knossos. And you can see the kids here holding the, the iPads. Uh, and then we've got uh, the, the guide that is telling them what to do, when to press, what to press. And of course, um, it's gives, she gives them more explanations of what they are seeing in the iPad. Uh, we saw this. Now, uh, this is the fourth uh, way that we're using, example of how we are using technology at Kids Low Greece. Um, as I said earlier, we're a travel agency. That means that we're helping people to organize uh, family vacation to Greece and to Crete in particular. Um, as you can imagine, you know, during COVID, we couldn't do that. So we had to stop all our trip planning services. You know, there were no trips happening. So we decided to take the decision and we decided to um, start a new activity and we started offering online live classes. Uh, Zoom classes. So um, one of the classes that we um, offer and we continue offering is, um, it's called the Labyrinth, the Minotaur and other tales from the Palace of Knossos online class. So basically think of it like an online class. We've got a storyteller who is based in Greece and uh, talks to the kids about the minimum civil civilization she shows through uh, presentation parts of our mobile app, parts of uh, Moptil's um, 3D virtual reality reconstruction of the, of the palace. We use also tools like Kahoot's and the polls within um, uh, the polls within Zoom to make the whole class more interactive. And we have seen a great interest on behalf of of people abroad, kids abroad that would love uh, learning more about uh, Crete and the Palace of Knossos and Greek mythology in, in general. Um, 
We have done a lot of these uh, classes in the past uh, few months, and uh, we have also presented those classes, not only to individuals, but also to schools. So by offering these online Greek mythology classes, we not only include people that have the financial means to travel at some point to Crete and see the Palace of Knossos in real life, but also to, to people that cannot afford going either because they don't have the financial means or they don't have the time or it's not the priority to travel to Greece at the moment. Um, so this is one of examples of our um, online classes that involves uh, Crete. And another one is here. It's one that we added uh, three, three months ago. It's again um, inspired by Crete. Uh, by the labyrinth in Crete, and it's a Greek mythology arts and crafts class. So we've got a storyteller in Crete. Uh, we are asking the parents that are interested in uh, having their kids participate in that class to have readily available some materials like, uh, you know, shoe boxes, paint, brushes, uh, strings. And under the guidance of the storyteller, the kids are creating their own crate and maze inspired by the labyrinth and the myth of the Jesus and the Minotaur. Uh, and here you can see some um, of the creations of the kids that have done you know, during these online classes. Um, and so far it has been very, very popular. Um, I think that was all. For now, I'm not sure whether you've got any questions now or later on, or you can always email me and if you would like to have an individual chat with me. Thank you, Katerina, very much. Uh, we would like to proceed to the third presenter right now. Geraldine, are you around? I am, absolutely. Okay, are you ready to start sharing your screen? I and am. once Here more for the audience, if you have questions, please keep track of them and we'll make sure to address all of them at the end. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, this is, <laughs> I really like following Katerina's presentation because compared to what you just presented, Katerina, mine's very analog. Um, I basically, and um, I won't, I, uh, anyway, and also Maria gave a very nice uh, background to what I do, so I, I won't go into that very much either. But I have used um, what I've been doing for almost 20 years, a little over 20 years actually, is uh, working on uh, utilizing different skills from uh, pot making uh, to cooking through archeology. span So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to use academic research to uh, create a program that can be shared with the public, um, regardless of what kind of level of um, education or interest you have on a variety of topics. So let me uh, get started. So the presentation outline, I'm just gonna have four points that I wanna share with you. One is defining what the Minoan Taste Program is and kind of that timeline. I think it's important to show uh, the background work that what goes into creating um, or taking academic research and creating a cultural um, heritage program that's specifically for the promotion of culture of a country or of a particular um, geographical region or society. Um, is something more than just uh, Googling. There's a lot of research behind it. Um, also, I wanna kind of introduce the foundation of that, which is starting with the basics uh, with archeology, span that's point two. Point three is the biggest factors that affect the research because everybody has challenges and uh, trials and errors. And I think that's important to show. And then point four is the takeaway from basically creating ambassadorial research that's um, really specifically intended for a public audience rather than an academic audience of your peers. So to begin with, I just wanted to show and share with you like basically what is Minoan Taste. Um, Minoan Taste is a private social enterprise uh, that promotes the culinary history of the Aegean by working with a network of food and craft experts and scholars. It is a Greek registered based uh, business and um, our clients range anywhere from um, local people and uh, silagos, which are clubs and education 
educational groups and outreach that we do. Um, we collaborate with them to do things for free that are good for the community, all the way to tour groups, um, to specialty, uh, to other specialty groups that deal speci uh, specifically with education. And, um, and then we also have private, private groups. My inner little slow guys, sorry. Uh, the timeline basically for Minoan Taste to create this project, it really began in 2006. And um, through that, I, had, I spent one full year just creating a thesis uh, and uh, exploring, you know, exploring, exploring the, the problem and process of being able to, what's the feasibility of finding the clay, creating the cooking pots? Um, was that possible? Did I have, uh, you know, the skills and uh, the supplies to do that? was, um, you know, we work in archeology span here in Greece, we work on really big projects and programs. So there's a lot of human resources to pull from, which is really amazing. So trying to navigate that, organize that, it, it took a lot of background. Um, this Caroline, was sorry to interrupt. Do you want me to share your PowerPoint? Is it not sharing? No, it's not sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, that's if okay. You don't, it's, my internet, um, it must Don't worry about that. Off. Just let me know what slide you are now on. Uh, we are on slide four. Did, did you guys miss the first three? Yeah, I can, that was the first one, right? That, uh, that's, that's the first one, yes. Second one, your outline, uh, which just went that's over right. verbally. The third one is this. The third one is the picture of Minoan taste. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth one. Correct. Yeah, I'm very sorry. I'm my internet. Don't worry about weird. that. That's okay. Don't worry. I know. And we're on a timeline, so mm -hmm. we don't have time for technical issues. Um, so very quickly, this was also part of my PhD. So from it took about seven years to actually get all of that organized to get the foundation of the storyline together. And since uh, since 2014 to 2021, or yeah, and beyond, let's say. Uh, sorry, can you go back? Uh, we started working with uh, universities and college students. Um, we ha we also work with the American Farm School in Thessaloniki. So we mentor um, their alternative tourism um, uh, students uh, for the past, uh, I believe, four years. And so that's been fantastic. We do a lot of publishing, presentation, and workshops. There's, uh, we work on the cor a large corpus of the Minimum Pottery at the different archeological sites. And of course, we continue to establish cooking and travel uh, business contacts and networking with Minoan Taste specifically. And then we are always uh, um, exploring new topics in cooking um, because I just think you have to stay fresh in the field, regardless if you're cooking in ceramic pots with fire or if you're using like the latest and greatest technology. So can you go to the next slide, Maria, please? So, uh, this goes into the archaeology, the second, uh, the third point in the presentation or second point. And basically, thanks to Maria, you understand where Crete is in the Aegean, which is awesome. And now I wanted to even get a little bit more uh, into it onto the island of Crete. And the, this is a particular site that the Americans have been working at for over a hundred years. And we've continued to work there in collaboration as a senior Garcia with the Greek archeologist here in the Ephoria. We have a fabulous uh, collaboration. And this particular site is fantastic because we have all levels of the Bronze Age plus Hellenistic, Roman and Byzantine and modern. And um, that's really important when you're trying to study issues like cooking and everyday things like craft production and trade and things like that. So this is the this is one of the major sources that I have for hands-on information for the Minoan Taste project, which is um, which is really fantastic. Next slide. So this just kind of lays it out very uh, quickly. Uh, we examine the material to discover its story. Basically, every every artifact has a story behind it. So we are constantly re-examining, re-evaluating our ideas, and repeating that process because often. You might have a hunch, but you really need to go back and, and dig into what that hunch is to understand if what you think is correct. Because oftentimes you're gonna do a lot of self-editing and then thankfully 
we work with amazing colleagues that are also help us um, edit <laughs> ourselves, which is fantastic. Um, but right here with this particular program in the center, you see some broken cooking pots with the three legs. That's the iconic Minoan vessel. These pots are fantastic for boiling and simmering uh, all sorts of food from vegetables to meat to seafood. And um, we uh, put these uh, sherds, these fragments of the pottery together like a 3D puzzle basically. And um, one of the things that we do is we look at the clay to see how it's made. And that's one of the things I did here. And so this particular, you see that some pots that I'm cooking at, some little tiny pots over there in that picture. And those uh, vessels were made out of clay from us that the potters there were using about 3000 years ago during the Minoan times. And down below, just to give you an idea, we have another set of specialists that we work with in archeology span that specifically look at food remains, which is really a phenomenal thing to do. And we collect the soil, we wash it, and we sieve it looking for bones and shells and seeds and all sorts of things that you think we might not be able to recover, but we can. And this tells us about the economy. This tells us about the diet. This also tells us um, about the environment on a certain level. So you can see down below that we recover things such as crabs, limpets, uh, top shell, goats, and olives. And oftentimes the specialists will look at the, um, how the preservation of a particular food remain is, um, is in, and they can tell us a little bit about what that food process was. And that's really phenomenal for me. And I really love that work and I appreciate all of them because I'm able to kind of take their ideas and understand what they're talking about and, and contextualize it in a hands-on event like cooking and experiential learning through a more sensory-based, very analog approach. Next slide. Next slide, please, Maria. Thank you. So to do this, there just it's just so that you understand a little bit about archaeology. Um, there's always a methodology behind what we do, and you take you start with the artifact in the center for this particular project, and you work around it. You figure out how it's made. You figure out what the material is. You have to understand the archaeological context. So you have to understand exactly what that context is, so you can read the object to know what the date is know what it means, if it came from a kitchen, if it came from a storage room, if it was local, um, if it was imported from another place. So all of these things are very important. Um, and we also talk to local, uh, local people and we talk to local potters, we talk to local food producers, local, um, I mean, in, this, in my case, local food producers. And if you're interested in shipbuilding, you'll talk to shipbuilders. But you talk uh, to, you basically do ethnography and just to get an idea for what people are doing that live in this particular environment with these particular um, constraints that in this physical world. Next slide, please. So the, to the next point that I wanted to make, we were talking about the different factors that affect um, the particular Minoan taste program when we're out cooking, when we're out sharing this kind of archaeological knowledge in a sensory based way um, through these cooking experiments and uh, cooking and eating together, basically, which is a very uh, Cretan thing to do. It's a very Greek thing to do. It's a very human thing to do. We all cook, we all understand it. And for the most part, we all love it. So um, we have three things that are really important that we have to keep in mind. They, they are our blessings and our challenges and sometimes our worst nightmare. We have a scale and time factor we always have to consider. We have weather and climate and we have people. Next slide. So the scale and time factor you can see here, we have all the way down from like a very small group where there's like one or two people and you can see how many, the size of the pots are much smaller, the, the area, everything you need is a little bit larger. And then you can scale it up and then um, you can see on the other side, the opposite side of the slide that you need much larger space, you need much larger pots, you need much larger food, much larger fuel, um, you have to take care of a, of a larger group of people. So everything is just like expanded exponentially. And with all of that means that you need more resources, more time, 
more energy, more thought, but the process is still the same. So when you talk about scaling your activities, that's really important to make sure that every time you do an activity, regardless if it's small or large, you have your basic building blocks and then you go out from there so that it's always successful, you always have the same result and that it's always enjoyable. Next slide, please. And weather and climate are also a huge factor. Um, oftentimes, because of the nature of the way that we cook in the pots with the charcoal and with the wood, you know, you don't necessarily want to do it indoors unless there's a large space with a very good ventilation system. So uh, that really kind of puts us in uh, some extreme situations that we have to deal with. Thank, God, thank goodness that we live in the Mediterranean and we have, for the most part, pretty good weather. But Crete, people don't understand unless they live in the Aegean, that it can be quite cold and quite rainy and windy here, um, particularly on the island of Crete, where you have like four large mountain mastiffs. So we have to think about weather all the time. We have to think about rain, the humidity, whether it's done in the night or during midday or in the morning. We have to always think about the wind and particularly what direction the wind is coming from and what type of wind it's bringing. If it's a hot wind, a cold wind, a wet wind, or, you know, there's a lot. And then extreme heat as well. Extreme heat is the best time to cook because you don't have to deal with all the other factors, but it's also, you have to take care of yourself physically so that you don't get ill. Um, but you can see down here where, you know, all of these different things, again, you have to prepare, you have to understand, and you have to know like what to do. Next slide, please. And then the people factor, uh, the people factor, like this, we do this for people and without the people, we wouldn't be able to do this. And, um, you know, this is one of the biggest pleasures of being able to share what you're doing and have a reason for that. And so basically we want to get the word out. We have to test the waters, everything, every time we do something, we, um, we're basically testing. Uh, we're finding an audience, finding different audiences all the time, and we're always repeating this process. So you can see here that we have um, a variety, most of these guys are local guys, but we also do have some students that have visited us here in this image and then from abroad as well. So, you know, we've had people as far away from Asia to uh, the United States, Australia, South America, almost every continent we've cooked for. And um, we work very closely with the Greek community and the local community, which is quite nice. So we work with chefs, travelers, community members, uh, then very local community members and schools. Next slide, please. And what we really want to make sure that we do is that we always keep in mind that it's an ambassadorial research. You know, we're not doing this for our colleagues who um, understand maybe more about the history or the academic side of, of life here on Crete, but we're doing it for ambassadorial work. And so we have to a little bit, um, let's say, uh, change our dialogue or modify our dialogue to reach our audience which is important. So we have to think about that um, and what happens. Um, but here we're always constantly dealing with, this is a, this is a slide actually, <laughs> well, I meant to kind of cut this one, but that's fine. But you have to, but these are kind of the, these are kind of the downfalls of some of this, you, but you know, some of the things that you, the challenges of running this in an extensive program is you have to continually make repair and discard pots. So for example, over the past 10 years, as Minoan Taste has been founded, we've had to, di we've had 50 pots. We've probably discarded at least a half of them. Um, you have to have a trained and knowledgeable staff that can work in multi-languages. Uh, you have a lot of time and energy every day that you put into the program, and that means after hours and on the weekends. So it sometimes is quite challenging for your personal life, and it can be a big distraction sometimes to other research interests, particularly if you're trying to, um, you know, explore new topics or kind of uh, put a stamp on some old ones. Next slide, please. And here. 
here is uh, just to kind of lay it down. Um, even though it is ambassadorial research, we always have to value and look at, we have to evaluate and look at, you know, the value that we're doing and the things that the challenges we're facing versus the headache. You know, are we getting value for our time? Are we getting value for the frustration that we face? And I obviously think that we do, but we have to look at it realistically. Can we go back, please? Thank you. So the goals are two goals. We have to use archaeology as a bridge to connect the modern and ancient people so that um, important social and environmental issues can be given a safer platform for discussion. And that changes according to the group always. Uh, number two, we also have to generate income. The program doesn't pay for itself unless we generate that income to do that. Uh, the challenges, of course, are always communication, no matter what. Uh, you have cultural, you have language, you have generational. Um, and you also have expertise that um, you need to kind of bridge those gaps. Um, often there's a lack of money, resources, and probably more than anything, there's a lack of time because typically you can find everything else. Um, but time is very hard to replicate. Um, and the most, in, uh, this might sound funny for a lot of people, but one of the things that we try to really do is minimize a copy paste culture and distribution of misinformation. And, and what I mean by that is, um, of course, we always want to encourage people to like also continue or to do what we're doing or what other people are doing because that's normal. We live in a society where we want to do that. But what we really try to do is make sure that our message is very clear and is very uh, succinct because we don't want disinformation to be spread because it makes our job harder when it comes to really trying to educate, really trying to teach, and really trying to make sure that people stay on point to things that are important and important um, archeologically and, and also to preserve cultural heritage because that's part of what we're trying to do. That's our mission. And so we want to really make sure that if, it, so we, in, in doing that, one of the ways that we try to mitigate that is we try to collaborate as much as we can so that we can form um, a more unified, um, group of people that are interested in Minoan cooking and through collaboration we try to work on making sure the correct information is um, maintained in the dialogue particularly when it goes into the public platform. Uh, the value of course is community building and involvement at all levels no matter what. Uh, education I believe no matter where you are in the world always starts at the grassroots level. And um, one of the biggest things that I enjoy, <laughs> I hope other people do as well, is that you're breathing a different kind of life into a gene archeology span and into the classical worlds to basically sustain a field um, that often can get stale and it needs to be created by local and an international interest that is beyond itself, but is inclusive of that. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. And I just wanted to show some different pictures of some of the cooking events that we've had here um, or different people um, that we've been able to cook with. So most of these are local groups or people that have come specifically to Crete. Um, Madhar Jeffra, she's up there in the center taking notes for one of her books that she's writing on the Aegean. Um, and then we also have like school kids that are doing Minoan painting on the cups. We have, uh, we did a big group with uh, Yanis Baksavadis uh, several years ago in Alunda over there and we were doing pita making, everybody else was doing pita making, you can see them rolling out. And then down below, this was one of the local groups um, in Irapetra and Lasithi, they were educators, they were teachers and they were wanting to learn more about the local food and about cooking, about archeology span to teach to their students. And so they, we did work, we workshopped it out and had them do some cooking. We uh, worked with a local uh, taverna. Uh, I, I, yeah, I guess it was a taverna. And, um, and so they kind of helped co-sponsor that. So you can see like, if you really think about what you want to do and what your mission is through this kind of work, you can kind of expand and you know, the possibilities are really endless. And last but not least, I have a thank you. <laughs> I have a thank you slide at the very end if you want to share that Maria. Um, so these are these are several of my our, our academic and archaeological colleagues that have supported me forever. <laughs> so thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Geraldine. I have tasted your food, uh, and I can tell it's also very good. Unfortunately, we cannot taste things through the cables, but 
hey, this is what we have these days and we have to take advantage of this. I hope you have enjoyed our presentations and you have seen at least the common thread being creativity and vitality in times of adversity, which all of us have been experiencing in many and different ways and levels for the past year or so. And we hope it's going to get better within the next six or 12 months to stay on the positive uh, you know, side. And um, I know we have been um, over time, but um, uh, Island Innovation is kind enough to allow us another five or 10 minutes maximum uh, to open the ground for questions to the speakers. So if you have a question and you would like to address it, please um, let us know in the chat and then I can unmute, unmute you and um, allow you to talk as Zoom uh, you know, says precisely. And um, each one of us will provide you with an answer. Any questions, anyone? I see very nice comments in the chat and thank you all very much for the positive vibes and um, you know the nice comments you're sending either to us individually or to all of the panelists and attendees. Are there any specific questions? Uh, I'm gonna type in my email. Sometimes people are shy asking on spot, if you would like Geraldine and Katerina to do that on the yeah. chat as well, so that people, uh, we can take questions at a later point as well. Katerina, do you want to unmute yourself as well? Yeah, I'm here. I just uh, typed my email in case anybody would like to you know, find out a little more about what we're doing. I think if you have any questions, uh, uh, you can ask in Greek or in English. We can answer. Yeah. The uh, Geraldine, there is a question actually from Alexandra Aerophilia, former student of mine. If there are opportunities for tourists to experience the Minoan cooking, uh, Alexandra is working for a travel agency in uh, the United States in okay. the Conshohocken, Pennsylvania area. Uh, if she sends people to Crete, so would you like to respond to that question since you are um, mostly on that field? Yeah, yes, um, absolutely. We do, uh, we do programming and we do, we basically customize all of our programming. So uh, that would be lovely. If you uh, want to get in contact with me, Alessandra, I would love to talk to you more about what you specifically were, are looking for so that we can do that. That would be wonderful. Yeah. So Thank I'm you. typing minoantastes.com. Alexandra has all the contact information for Geraldine, cell phone number, email, everything. So just uh, get a hold of her, okay? She's also spending time in Philadelphia when she's in the United States. So perhaps you'll have the chance <laughs> <laughs> to meet uh, in person too. Any other questions? <clears throat> I do not see any questions either on the queue. Two more messages. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki Rose. <laughs> Nikki is well, also hi, working Nikki. on the field uh, of sustainability cooking and food in Crete. And she recently came up with a documentary as well, which is very interesting. Nikki, if you would like uh, to type in uh, in the chat the link to your most recent project, maybe people would be interested in um, uh, taking a look at that as well. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Oh, okay. Uh, Cookingincrete.com, there you can see Nikki Rose's, uh, you know, projects that relate uh, to Crete, Greece as well. So, Again, we have um, our email addresses on the chat. We would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank very much Katerina Makatuni and Geraldine Morrison for taking time off <laughs> to uh, prepare all this and put it together. It has been very challenging, um, especially since we are all uh, very much cable loaded uh, this period of time. And uh, I would also like to thank Island Innovation. And I'm reminding you that there is gonna be a free virtual island summit on September, I believe uh, September 6 to 12, 2021. 
And uh, Isabel, would you like to, um, to share a reminder about this, please? Yes, uh, I have right the, the link on the chat, but the, you can visit this link and you will find all the information. Uh, we haven't, the, you, you cannot find more information, much information there because we are uh, working on that. But the Virtual Island Summit will be from September 6 to 12th this year. And you are all invited to participate there because you can uh, know uh, more information about the island worldwide. So you are all invited to participate there. And okay. Thank you so much, Maria, Geraldine, Katerina. Uh, I really enjoy this uh, this webinar. So I think uh, uh, you did a really good presentation today. I learned so much about Greek, uh, about Greece, and and all that dimension. So thank you so much for creating this uh, initiative. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all very much again. And my wish for you tonight is to find Ariadne's thread and get yes. out of this labyrinth <laughs> and get this uh, Minotaur that is apparently <laughs> troubling us uh, so much, okay? Have a great night, evening, uh, midday. I don't know where in the world you are. Nice um, uh, listening to the presentations and being able to engage with uh, the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. Bye-bye.